Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Pereira. Indian Foreign Secretary S. Jay Shankar held talks with the top leadership of Bhutan this week. The first such interaction between the two countries since India and China ended a 1073 day military standoff on Bhutan's Doklam Plateau in August. According to an Indian Foreign Ministry statement, Jay Shankar, who landed in Bhutan on Sunday, called on the country's current monarch as well as his father, besides the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister. The Foreign Secretary held discussions on the complete range of bilateral relations, including implementation of the ongoing Government of India-assisted projects, trade and economic ties, hydropower cooperation and people-to-people -people contacts. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse the bilateral ties between India and Bhutan and look at the way forward. Joining me on the programme today are Bharat Karnad, Research Professor, National Security Studies, Centre for Policy Research, P. Stobdan former ambassador and senior fellow at Indian at the Institute for Defence Studies and Analysis and Jan Jacob of the Hindustan Times. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Professor Karnad, I'd like to begin with you. Post Doklam, do you believe that a visit of this sort was uh, on the cards and was required and should it have happened earlier? Yeah, I think uh, post Doklam certain things needed to be clarified because um, when the Duklam crisis, you know, in a sense, uh, was precipitated by the Chinese intrusion into, into Bhutanese territory, uh, the problem was about the legitimacy of Indian intervention to, in a sense, counter the Chinese move. And the fact was that uh, Thimpu was not particularly vocal in letting the world know that they had, in fact, done so. India had, in fact, intervened uh, because of the 2020. 20 agreement, tripartite agreement mm -hmm. between China, Bhutan and India. Sure. That, that border has to be frozen pending a final solution, negotiated solution. So I think uh, Jashenka would have gone there to, in a sense, um, ask of the Bhutanese government that they be more forthright in their, in their commitment to their own territory mm -hmm. and to India's role in protecting it and safeguarding it. So I think that's one of the things that uh, Jashenka sought to accomplish and I think he perhaps has. Okay, fair enough. You know, let me go to the ambassador. Now, Ambassador Stobdan, uh, what was the purpose of Jashenka's visit to Bhutan, do you think? No, as uh, Mr. Kannada uh, was saying, uh, this was very important, of course. I would say that this should have taken place a couple of weeks before. Uh, partly because uh, this objective seemed to be to arrest the drift that has occurred at the diplomatic level. The standoff at Doklam was a military standoff. But the mainstay of our relationship with Bhutan is diplomatic and cultural, as you rightly said, people to people and deep political trust. I'm sure that something has happened, as Mr. Kanad was also talking about it. I think Mr. Jayashankar's visit this time is to arrest that whatever that misunderstanding, if any, may have occurred. And uh, this, this was quite due, and I think this, uh, this, is a, this is a very important visit that I consider. And uh, at the same time, I think there are a number of issues, as, as you rightly said in the beginning, that uh, a vast range of uh, uh, bilateral issues that have been discussed. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, thrown issues, including GST, including demonetization. All these things have, uh, have really impacted on the ground in the indo bhutan relationship, uh, not just with Bhutan, but also with Nepal. Mm. I think with the neighboring countries, we need to be very sensitive, whatever the policies that we, we evolve for ourselves in the, at the national level. And I'm told that uh, the GST itself has... Uh, created so much confusion within Bhutan in terms mm. of trade. The economy is very small and largely dependent on Indian export. So I think uh, it, it was a good uh, opportunity now to discuss some of these difficult issues, and I'm sure they must have found some solutions uh, for the way ahead. All right, sure. Uh, Jan Jacob, I'd like to bring you into the picture now. You know, what is the status of the ties, the bilateral ties between the two neighbors? I think by all means, Bhutan remains one of India's closest partners. That's if you look at the bilateral relationship, the way these countries 
cooperate international issues. For example, other than India, Bhutan was the only country which, among major countries which stayed away from one road, one belt initiative hmm. of China. Bhutan is not part of China led Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Bhutan and India have a closer ties on UN issues, etc., etc. But at the same time, I think the way you see Bhutan through a Chinese prism, that has to change to an extent. Bhutan, again, doesn't have a very uh, vibrant media. But if you go through the, what the young Bhutanese are commanding on social media, etc., I don't think the way you see Bhutan as taken for granted kind of a partner will last forever. Hmm. So I think it is time India also take a relook at the way the way India has been dealing with Bhutan on major issues, especially when it comes to hydropower cooperation. The ambassador spoke about GST issues like that. Don't forget, Bhutan has most of its trade ties with India, perhaps in, with India only. It has to walk an extra mile, and India has to reinvent the way India deals with Bhutan to get the tie last longer and more enduring. That said, uh, Professor Karnad, is there a need for India to revisit its Bhutan policy? Yes, I think it has to centrally rebuild it along a different structure. Hmm. Basically and what would that structure be? That would be, for instance, uh, as uh, Ambassador Stobdan mentioned, the GST and demonetization and so on have particularly hurt our neighboring countries where Indian currency is legal tender. So what do you do uh, with countries that have taken you on good faith, traded with you in, on good faith, and then realize that they have been uh, stuck up like other Indians, I mean all the citizenry, um, with a problem that it's unable to solve by itself. Um, I hope to, I really hope that the Indian government uh, has, is thinking about in some ways reimbursing the governments of Bhutan and Nepal and any other country uh, that is so inconvenienced um, uh, to reimburse them for the, dis you know, the, the, the deficits that perhaps they have faced in financial terms and make up so that they don't feel as if they have lost out. It's very important. The other thing I think uh, that is an issue is I think Thimpu's demand for slightly higher uh, returns in terms of uh, the hydroelectric plants that we are financing and we are building for Bhutanese, uh, for the Bhutanese people, and the revenue they get from it. They want to up the revenue a bit. It's a very reasonable thing. It's a natural resource. They are helping us uh, to exploit. And of course, they benefit hugely from it. But equally, they want to be, shall we say, remunerated appropriately. So that is another thing I hope Jay Shankar has uh, at least achieved some measure of agreement on. Sure. Okay. You know, uh, Ambassador, traditionally, of course, uh, the ties between India and Bhutan have been extremely strong. Bhutan openly supported India during uh, our wars with Pakistan and China. But as it stands today, uh, can both the countries say that, they, uh, that we share the same kind of relationship? Uh, I think that's why both the, with the panelists there, I think they were very right. We need to reinvent or at least reshape our policy. The old-fashioned you know, diplomacy will not work any longer, like the colonial type of uh, relationship that we had built with Bhutan and other neighboring countries. Uh, I think that's over. We need to change the approach uh, of giving a particular stake in the development uh, that we have in India. Uh, clearly, I think like even Make in India program that now we have launched is going to impinge on the economy of, uh, of Bhutan or Nepal or many other small countries uh, in South Asia. For example, whatever small industries that are there in Bhutan would be killed completely if we do not take into consideration uh, the, their sensitivity, their productivity, their industrial production. If we, if we follow a certain uh, economic policies and reforms that we do in our own country is not matched with the neighboring countries, then we're going to land up with a lot of these uh, bilateral issues. Secondly, I think the, whatever has happened in Doklam has happened for good. I think it was a blessing in disguise in the sense that we have learned some lessons, uh, not just on the security and the military front, but also to take caution uh, what new things we can do with, uh, at least to maintain it. You know, the interesting part about India-Bhutan relationship is that the relationship has always been driven by Bhutanese, not by India. Mm. 
it is the king of Bhutan who is actually used to drive the relationship in good faith and good trust. But that I believe in the last couple of years or since 2013 onwards, something has uh, cropped up. And I think I would say it is only at the top political leadership and at the top uh, diplomatic uh, level, the Bhutanese relations should, uh, should be handled. No other institution, including the military, should be allowed to interfere uh, too much into our bilateral relationship. Okay, sure. You know, what are the areas of cooperation then to try and enhance this bilateral relationship, Chair Jacob? Frank, I think you have to ex address two existing issues. For example, if you look at the GST and the latent issue, what is India's plan, uh, grand assistance to Bhutan? It hmm. comes around 4,500 crore. Yes. What is Bhutan's trade deficit? It's 3,200 crore. 90 percentage of that trade deficit is with India. If you don't address that kind of a trade deficit with a country with who you they do most of their trade with, then it is not a sustainable proposition. People will stand up and ask why this is happening in an unequal fashion. You know the kind of trade deficit issue we rake up with China. So Bhutan's case is all the more special because they trade mostly with us, number one. Number two, you look at the power cooperation. So there is a commitment from India to buy from by tw uh, the year 2020, 10,000 megawatt of power. But the problem again, as we have seen the latest uh, this thing, Bhutanese have been requesting India to allow them to enter into the primary market. But India is saying only the companies which have 55 per so sorry 51 percent they stake held by Indians can take part in this. Always, as Parat Karnad was saying, the kind of power rate which India gives to Bhutan is very low. You can argue saying that you were giving them 70 percentage grant and 30 percentage loan for building projects like Tala, which produces around 1400 megawatt power. But again, you have to relook at these things because if you enter into your primary market where power is sold around 5 to 7 rupees or 8 rupees, and if they are telling a country like Bhutan, whose economy is heavily dependent on hydropower, no to benefit out of that kind of an arrangement, I don't think that is a proposition which can last for long. So I think so these, these issues, issues need to be addressed first before we move on to anything else. That's what I think. Okay, fair enough. You know, moving ahead now, you know, Professor Karnad, as far as China is concerned, China is continuously trying to assert itself in this particular region. Is there a fear then that uh, the Bhutanese kai might just get closer towards China and drift away from India? Well, look, uh, there are elements uh, within the Bhutanese government and their representative assembly uh, that in fact are advocating getting nearer to China uh, in effect to increase the leverage with India, if nothing else. There might be uh, those who say that we should get closer to China anyway. Something that Nepal has done successfully. It has done successfully and is uh, being rewarded for it with greater Indian attention. Now, would Delhi rather Bhutanese go the way the Nepalese have done and get to a point where things become irretrievable as has near, nearly happened in Nepal for us, we sort of rescued the situation in the nick of time, as it were. And that's, a, shall we say, a optimistic view of things. We may still not you know, regain the kind of position we had. But even so, I think the point to make is that uh, Nepal, there's another aspect to, um, you know, in a sense, um, sustain Bhutanese economy through the hydropower diplomacy. And that is, if the Bhutanese are happy with the arrangement of selling hydropower to India, financed and so on, uh, constructed by India and so on, um, that could be the model for Mahakali and other rivers in Nepal. Mm. The Nepalese are looking, hey, that's not a bad deal, because the Bhutanese have benefited, they have the highest per capita income of all South Asian countries, incidentally. And that's why there's a happiness index in which I think uh, Bhutanese uh, top the scale, as it were. So these are things that the Nepalese bear in mind, but then equally they don't want to be treated as Thimpu is by India. So uh, they are caught between the economic imperatives of involving India in exploiting their natural resources and at the same time not be, shall we say, subsumed by the Indian um, Republic, wherein uh, Nepal is treated as virtually an extension of the Indian state. Uh, and, and that, I think, uh, hurts their amour propre, uh, and you don't want that. Uh, I think they should all be treated with the greatest respect and regard, and that should apply equally to all our neighbors.
Sure. You know, Ambassador, what's the perception on the ground in Bhutan as far as uh, India's policies uh, towards Bhutan are concerned among the general public? Well, I think nobody hates uh, India. Everybody loves India. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, I would say even the Bhutanese are willing to shed blood for India. Uh, if you recall, the fourth king, in fact, led a, uh, uh, you know, a war against the insurgents uh, in, uh, near Assam, if you recall, a couple of years ago. So they are willing to do anything for India. But I think it's only for us to see how this relationship has to be maintained. Uh, we are a bigger country. You know, we, we are not a coherent in, as much as that Bhutan has today, socially, politically, and culturally. So as a result, there are a lot of discrepancies between the two countries. We are a big democracy. There is a controlled democracy. And I think uh, we need to take these things into consideration. Otherwise, you know, I think next year you're going to have election now in Bhutan coming up. And if we, again, talk too much about uh, flourishing of democracy in Bhutan and all these things, then, then the media will uh, try to create a lot of confusion. That Indian role in the Bhutanese democracy and elections, this kind of confusion uh, leads to a bigger problem. I think this is uh, the time that we should restrain ourselves. Our media has to restrain, uh, our print and electronic media especially. They bring out a lot of stories which really they're not appreciated by the Bhutanese themselves. Uh, because they don't like to operate the way we operate in India. We are a far bigger dynamic, uh, you know, system that we mm. have, which we like or we don't like, but we have that. But the Bhutanese are very sensitive about this kind of a thing. So we, that is why I said that it has to be regulated very, very carefully by a political leadership and senior diplomat, uh, not just by, you know, some politicians keep visiting there, making speeches and this and that. That actually ruined our relationship with Nepal also in the past. So th therefore, I think uh, it's a both economic, political, trade, all these things need to be regulated very, very carefully. Okay, fair enough. You know, I'm going to go back to the point uh, that we were talking about China. You know, uh, the boundary dispute between Bhutan and China has not been resolved just, the way, just as the way uh, the boundary between India and China has not been resolved. So do you believe that in the near future that the Chinese are going to reassert themselves uh, in the region? I think there is a fair possibility. Like you, you, Bhutan and China are conducting a border talks for so many years. It's 24 rounds and so on. Like you can look at the past and take consolation that in 1996 Bhutan was offered a much uh, greater convenient agreement sort of thing for settling the border. They didn't uh, accept it because they were factoring in Indian sensibilities etc. etc. But somewhere down the line China will try to exert its influence as its economy grows and its global ambitions grows in this area as well. So I don't think the way India has managed its geopolitical interest with Bhutan so far will not be the same once Chinese have become more assertive in this region, especially Bhutan is wedged between China and uh, India. And also Chinese have tested this policy as the fellow panelists have said here with Nepal with a reasonable amount of success. So I think the Chinese will try its best and Doklam is Note one of an incident may not be on that scale, but things like that keep can keep on happening in the Bhutan China border is my reading. Sure. You know, the fact that Bhutan or rather China does not have a formal diplomatic relationship with Bhutan, has that worked in our favor, Professor Karnad? Uh, yes and no. Um, yes, because we are in charge uh, de facto and de jure uh, for the for the conduct of Bhutanese foreign affairs. But that puts even greater weight on India be mindful of Bhutanese interests. Uh, that's often forgotten, that we keep merely the Indian interests in mind. And when we uh, talk you know, on behalf of Timpu to the Chinese. Now, the Chinese for many, many years have tried desperately to distance uh, Bhutan from India, um, offering all kinds of inducements. Uh, the usual infrastructure projects uh, grand, on a grand scale, connectivity, etc., etc. And uh, that is something that many Bhutanese find very attractive. Now the question but yet is... yet they have resisted. Yet they have resisted. Now what does that say about the Bhutanese, uh, shall we say, I don't want to call it loyalty, but friendship, the degree of friendship they feel for India. Uh, and their sensitivity to India's concerns. 
Um, so that has to be borne in mind and therefore India has to appropriately have a policy of not just uh, treating Bhutanese uh, in a proconsular way, uh, but to genuinely think of it as perhaps the closest ally and friend we have, not just in this region, but in the world. Um, and, and then um, also to the extent that we can mitigate the problem uh, that the Bhutanese have uh, in terms of not having direct relations, diplomatic relations with Beijing. Now, I don't know how that can be done because uh, ultimately we see uh, the Bhutanese relations with China through the Indian prism. Yes. Um, that is inevitable. Uh, but I think in consultation, therefore our consultations with Thimpu would have to be so much more intense and deeper so that we at all times are empathetic to the Bhutanese um, view of their own interests and to the extent possible accommodate them when we are talking to the Chinese. Sure. You know, uh, moving ahead now, Ambassador, do you believe that this visit of Subramaniam Jayashankar should be followed up by a, a high-level political visit to Bhutan, or do you think that that's going to be counterproductive? No, no, I think the visit should uh, take place from their side. Uh, there's no need for our leadership to rush to Bhutan at this stage. Uh, that would send a wrong signal. Uh, but I think the Bhutanese uh, Prime Minister will always have a chance uh, to visit New Delhi. Uh, that has been the tradition. In fact, you know, we used to trust uh, the Bhutanese diplomats, senior diplomats, who used to be like our diplomats, the diplomats for India. Uh, they used to work for us uh, in a way that the internationally they are uh, the goodwill ambassadors for India. But over a period of time, not just with the diplomats, even with the military institution in Bhutan, I think there is a trust deficit now. Uh, those things need to be restored. After all, we have helped Bhutan build its own armed forces. We are training their military. Now, if we have, if we have trained the Bhutanese, uh, Royal, Royal Bhutanese uh, Army, then we must also have trust in them in, in terms of defending their territories vis-a-vis -vis China. But if you do not trust the Bhutanese, then there will always be a suspicion in our mind that surely Bhutan and China would be doing something together, and that leads to a lot of suspicion. I think it's better that Bhutanese should be put on the front, and the, even militarily. I think the Indian troops, if, if at all required their services, they should do stand behind. Uh, that's what happened in Doklam. We jumped ourselves into the thing, and the, 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 the Chinese kept on saying that Indian troops should withdraw. But they never said the Bhutanese troops should withdraw. So this is the cleverness of the, the Chinese. They play all sorts of game hmm. and we need to be sensitive about all these things and uh, that's why i think uh, some higher level leadership should be visiting india uh, to strengthen the uh, trust and uh, you know or the traditional bond of friendship i think bhutan is the best friend that we ever have uh, uh, we can't have say that in the same length uh, nepal is a good friend of india but okay. Bhutan is certainly a good friend of India. Indeed, I, I think we've, we've asserted that point that Bhutan is a very good friend of India. But what's the way forward? How can we take this friendship to the next level? So Frank, I think also if you talk about the high-level visit, because Prime Minister Modi had chosen Bhutan as his as first, first, first port of call. Yes. He went there. But the point is that down that level, like our other ministers, ministry, they should also wake up to that vision. Like Prime Minister Modi went there, he also spoke a lot about hydroelectric projects, but still there are issues that can be sorted out at much lower level still remain unresolved. So I don't think a high level political visit is necessary for that kind of issues to be sorted, number one. Second, for GST, Bhutan had clearly asked for an exemption from India. So I think it should have been granted. I don't know why it was not done. So I think even without a high level visit, there are some nut and bolt issues in the relationship which should be fix first rather than we always focusing that high level visit will take the relationship to the next level because if you talk to the average Bhutanese diplomat or average people etc they have these daily issues because they are heavily dependent on India I think if you address these issues first I think larger issues also some can fine tuning is required not a major overhaul is what you're suggesting at this point in time yeah. okay uh, Bharat Karnat close the show for us with your concluding remarks well basically I think if if, as we consider Bhutan uh, to be a very good friend and very intimate ally, uh, then I think it has to be given that stature and treatment. Uh, that involves, for instance, I think the necessity uh, to perhaps consult with Thimpu on matters 
concerning India security that doesn't involve Bhutan. Hmm. They'll feel involved. By, by that I mean, why can't we involve Bhutanese in get their views and their perspectives on India's relations with Nepal, with Pakistan, with China, with other South Asian countries, even the Indian Ocean region? Why not? Because after all, they're very much part of our Indian um, military policy uh, matrix. They are in the grid uh, and they should be very much concerned with what it is that India is doing. And to the extent that they feel involved, uh, they'll feel all the more connected with India. And I think that's the way to go because I think the idea is to increase Bhutan's role, you know, give it the feeling, give right. the Bhutanese government the feeling that they have a stake in India's well-being, sure. just as we have a very central stake in their well-being and future. I, th I think you summed it up very well for us and we'll wrap uh, the show on that note. I'd like to thank all my guests for joining me on the program. Uh, Bharat Karnad, uh, P. Stobdan, uh, Jen Jacob, thank you gentlemen for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's all the time we have today. See you again next time.